Dear colleagues, dear participants of the round table, dear listeners, welcome. We are having a small delay in our session dedicated to innovative uh, approaches in geological survey and hydrocarbon production. My name is uh, Nikolai Grachov. I'm vice president and executive director of the Skolkova Foundation. Let me introduce uh, our participants here. We are having a very prominent audience today. And uh, I'm sure they will be able to look at the topic of our today's roundtable from uh, different angles. Uh, first, I would like to welcome here Iskander Ahadov, Director of the Center for Hydrocarbon Production of the Skolkova Institution of Science and Technology. Andrei Gaidamaka, Vice President uh, for Investor Relations, Lukoil and Valery Karpov, uh, Deputy General Director for Field Development, RETEC. We are happy to welcome here our guest from Brazil, Karen Breitman, Vice President, General Director, Research Center, EMC Brazil. Welcome. Then, Natalia Panina, Head of uh, the Center for Expertise in Process Industries, uh, SAP CIS. Um, Anton Maximenko, partner of McKinsey and Company. And next to Anton, we have Denis Borisov, Director for Analytics, the Moscow Oil and Gas Center of Ernst and Young. And finally, Viktor Skarabagatov, uh, Gazprom Vnigas. We will also have Alexei Kulapin, head of the department uh, for the Ministry of Energy. He will come in in a few minutes. Now I would like to start our discussions. The topic is dedicated to innovative approaches uh, and R&D in geological survey and hydrocarbon production. It's clear that oil and gas companies are facing new technological challenges uh, that they need to overcome both in Russia and abroad. This is about shale, oil, and gas, uh, about uh, hard to recover reserves, uh, offshore production, and a lot of other technological challenges uh, which are approached by companies differently. We can see it uh, very clearly from the example of the shale revolution. We can see that new technologies are, are born very frequently not inside major oil and gas companies, uh, but within some smaller companies which are more mobile, more flexible, and which are ready to take on new approaches. So today, I would like to discuss not just the technologies and the matter of which technologies are becoming more important, but to listen to your opinion, your presentation regarding the approaches uh, that are becoming more common in this area, how we can attract uh, innovations on the market and how the new players in this segment can cooperate with oil and gas companies, um, how universities and institutions uh, perform their own role in this innovative process. We hope that we will also hear the point of view of the Ministry of Energy, uh, the point of view on how to support this innovative process, uh, what is done in other countries uh, to encourage uh, innovations in the oil and gas industry. And at the end of our discussion, I hope that our guests uh, will formulate their positions on what is lacking in innovations in the oil and gas industry and what needs to be done there. We will have an hour and a half, so I suggest that uh, our presentations be limited by 10 minutes, so that uh, after that we will also be able to ask more questions, uh, and um, we will have a, a discussion 
on both topics. So let's uh, limit the first round of our discussion with just five minutes. Uh, and the first question I would like to ask uh, is uh, to Iskander Ahatov. Iskander, you've been working in uh, various uh, United States uh, universities, and now you had uh, the Department of Hydrocarbon Production in the Skolkova Institution. What are the most promising approaches uh, to hydrocarbon production and geological survey. And if you had a presentation, please uh, put it on the screens. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see all of you at one round table. I'm not going to show this presentation or advertise uh, the scientific center that we have uh, in uh, the Skolkova institution. I would like to share my approaches uh, regarding non-conventional hydrocarbons. That is, uh, when humanity saw that it is um, very important to find new approaches, new technologies uh, in production hydrocarbons. Uh, and. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, the new phenomena regarding or involving shale gas or, or non-conventional resources. Uh, the physical ph phenomena happening there are much more complicated than the conventional methods of uh, hydrocarbon production. And um, actually, I'm a physicist uh, by education, and that's uh, what really excites me. But of course, there are also economic uh, and uh, social aspects, uh, but I will focus on what I understand the best myself. Uh, analysis has shown that uh, this plethora of phenomena results in the fact that one scientist or one group, uh, one team of scientists or one institution cannot uh, address uh, those problems efficiently. Let's uh, get the analogy of turbulence or cancer. Why haven't these uh, problems been resolved? Uh, turbulences are very different, uh, and there are lots of different types of cancer. We can find some uh, specific situations where there can be a solution, but it's uh, very difficult to find a comprehensive approach to this phenomenon, because it's a very multifaceted phenomenon. And the same goes to non-conventional resources. Uh, we can uh, drill wells. Uh, one well will actually provide a fountain of uh, oil and uh, a steady flow of it, but the other one will be completely dry. So what's the best approach uh, to this problem? What's the solution? Now that I've been working abroad uh, for a long time, and in Russia too, I believe that we need to integrate our efforts uh, at platforms uh, like this uh, Open Innovations Forum. We need to set up uh, international university structures and associations, bringing together experts from uh, different areas uh, uh, of knowledge. Just one example from our institution on how we approach the organization of uh, this platform, which will help us uh, increase our understanding of uh, non-conventional hydrocarbons. First, uh, we prepared a very thorough survey of uh, experts from both Russia and abroad working with uh, non-conventional hydrocarbons who shared their opinions on the main challenges uh, we are faced there. Secondly, we chose international partners uh, who can make a major contribution to this cauldron of knowledge. I'm not talking about uh, know-how or property of patents uh, obtained by companies. Uh, I'm talking about the base of knowledge that we need uh, to continue our innovations. Uh, on this screen, you can see 
a series of partners from different universities uh, whom we selected uh, very thoroughly for this uh, Skolkova Foundation, Skoltierha, and who are going to participate in uh, addressing the non-conventional hydrocarbon challenges. Uh, these are the main areas uh, that we need to work in. These are the five labs we are preparing in Skolterh. This is uh, the enhanced oil recovery, the frag jobs, the physics and thermodynamics uh, on, of oil fluid, including hydrates uh, and uh, gas condensates. The highly productive calculations, uh, high performing calculations, uh, because right now it's impossible to find a solution by just uh, solving a number of simple equations. Uh, and finally, uh, geostatistics, uh, which is paramount uh, to pr produce uh, hydrocarbons at the Bajen suit, for example. How do we accumulate uh, geological information? gathered there. So if we work uh, in this uh, open scientific field, uh, in this uh, hub, uh, as uh, Skolter is, uh, to resolve all those tasks and problems, uh, I think uh, this will be very helpful. And uh, this scientific information should be open, no secrets whatsoever. Everything should be published in the open media. I think uh, my time is over. Iskander, thank you very much. A question to you. This open interaction of different companies uh, in innovative projects. What are the problems uh, of intellectual rights? Uh, how uh, intellectual property rights and how are these problems uh, resolved? Uh, for example, in the West. Uh, well, this is a very tough question. When we talk about contracts between universities uh, and companies, uh, the interests of uh, the companies uh, clash with uh, those of uh, universities because companies believe that they invest uh, money in this field, uh, so uh, the intellectual property rights should belong to them, and scientists who invented it all believe that uh, the rights should belong to them. But actually, this uh, question has to be answered on a case by base uh, case by case basis uh, that depends uh, on the contribution of the research and development units uh, and the oil companies uh, I myself believe uh, that uh, there is uh, an acceptable option when an oil company orders work from the university and this means that all the rights should belong to the oil company and the university should use uh, the funding of the oil company uh, to address the tasks, uh, to provide education for the students, uh, and this will make this university stronger, and uh, that will be its benefit. In the United States, uh, the issue of intellectual property rights uh, is a very complicated one, and uh, I have witnessed many situations when universities uh, refused to sign a contract with oil companies, uh, with the industry, uh, and could not find a common language with companies who were ready to share their money. So actually, uh, this is a pro an international problem. Well, I hope that in Skoltak, this issue will be addressed. Now, moving on to the point of view of oil companies. Uh, Andre, a question to you. The preparation of the R&D and investment program, which is a, both a short-term and a long-term program. Is it uh, uh, for the company itself, or is it part of a joint project with institutions uh, and other organizations? So what's Lukoil's approach, and how are you planning this innovative activity? Thank you. I also have a short presentation, and I will show it to you very quickly, and I will answer your question by producing this presentation. First of all, we all know that uh, the conventional 
oil reserves in Russia are compatible with just what one Bajan suite can give us in terms of the resources from oil saturated rocks. And uh, what we have there is much more than all the resources that we have on our balance uh, uh, for conventional reserves. But uh, it's not a very good comparison, because here we have uh, resources and their reserves. And it's not uh, very much compatible. What we have on kerogen is uh, the thermal gas impact method. And this is uh, a fundamental survey because uh, this uh, technology does not exist from the commercial point of view today. Of course, we have um, some shell research on this matter. But here we invest uh, our own money because we are developing our own technology. Uh, regarding how to find the best approach to produce uh, the uh, oil and gas we currently have. Um, and uh, the fact mentioned by the previous speaker is something that we believe to be very important. Uh, for us, it's important not to develop uh, some fundamental technologies. Uh, of course, a lion's share of technologies that we have is uh, something that has already been tried uh, somewhere in the world. Uh, that is uh, the frack jobs, for example. And of course, uh, we do not do just kerosene. We do oil and gas. And um, this area is uh, the most important for us. Uh, and most of the investment goes there. I took just one example. That's uh, our Vinogradova field. Uh, and we can see that uh, the oil production in over the previous years is different from what uh, we recently got. Uh, and the difference is threefold or fourfold. Uh, we had an improvement uh, due to new technologies, uh, due to our know how. So I would like to say here that uh, our reserves uh, were just zero at the beginning. And now we are planning to produce uh, more than 10 a million barrels uh, in 2016 just out uh, of uh, this field. Uh, and it's very good that uh, the government uh, improved uh, the tax uh, treatment um, for these uh, hard to recover reserves uh, because uh, it's a very expensive business. Uh, if we have to pay the taxes, it would be impossible. So now we believe uh, that this cooperation with the government is very fruitful because we show to them what we are doing, uh, what we are ready to, to do, uh, be, that we are ready to recover those hard to recover reserves. Uh, and the government shows that uh, it is uh, ready to give us some uh, tax benefits. So as a result, we have quite stable production. But uh, further steps will depend on the dialogue between uh, the company and the government. One example to show you. Now we look at the Bajan suite at uh, Kirogen. And this is our fundamental research once again. So if we look uh, in the middle, here in green is uh, what we produce. Uh, you can see it very well, but you can see the color. So in the new fields of uh, West Siberia, we earn just uh, a little bit of money, but we can survive thanks to that. Uh, we just develop uh, the conventional fields uh, and reservoirs. And um, this is uh, the thermal gas method, the revenue that we get uh, with existing uh, taxation. And there are just losses there. We cannot gain anything from that. Uh, but thanks to the fact that uh, in 2013, uh, law, Federal Law 213 was adopted, and uh, because there was no uh, oil tax there, we could earn a little bit uh, from that field. Uh, but that's not enough. We need new flexible tools. Uh, it's not just a question of money, but uh, 
what we are saying is that the existing tax system is not flexible enough. It does not uh, comply with the economic realities. So we need to have some economic and financial incentives as we produce uh, hard to recover deposits. And today, the average production for Russia is uh, a little bit less than 10 tons per day. And in the United States, it's less than two tons per day. But they have this possibility to have enhanced oil recovery, even uh, from uh, depleted uh, fields, because their tax treatment is better. And actually, right now, more than 3.5 million barrels per day is produced from uh, deposits with uh, reservoirs that have a low permeability. Right now, our company is acknowledged by the Ministry of Energy, and uh, we had uh, we have a contract with the Ministry of Education and Science of Russia. We are now working with the Skolkova Foundation and Retech, which is our subsidiary, is also cooperating with other companies, including Zarubezhnevt, uh, to promote certain know-how and technologies. Let me just put two questions here to issue in, in conclusion. Valery Borisovich here, if uh, something need, will need it to be added, please. So the Lukoil company is a huge corporation with their own management structures and their own decision-making process, while Retech was uh, specifically made, custom-made as a Russian uh, fuel and energy company for innovations and 100% daughter for Luke Oil with a separate independent decision-making process which has to be approved later by Luke Oil management. Uh, why is that so? Because the point was of to set a company to deal with more advanced and uh, higher risk investments in new technologies. And this is uh, how we are trying to bridge the gap between a larger corporation and a more uh, prompt, agile decision-making. There's a more fundamental question here that was Mr. Haddock had asked. I mostly work with uh, money and investments, and investments always ask when they get the money back and how much will be the return. I personally believe Russia is, has probably one of the major issues that there's so many interesting developments, engineering developments, fundamental research results. And we also see a lot of uh, smart and clever scientists. And they come and tell us, OK, we well, can do this uh, wave uh, influence on the reservoir. But there's a very thin layer of venture capitalists who are prepared to take up an interesting idea and bring it up to the pilot production plant. So it is then then uh, major companies prepare to take further investment risks, not to uh, spend a fundamental technology, but other to apply the already existing know-how and buy it. So I've decided for us that we should do that inside. We do have a daughter company, a branch, and we are financing it. And among other things, they're doing this fundamental research as well. But this is rather an exception from the rules. This is our approach to resolve a fundamental problem. Thank you. But was your question? You had a question? Well, I believe the main question is not exactly the development of technologies themselves, which is good in itself. And it's, it's, it's very good that we're collecting those all through, throughout Russia and uh, looking for those worldwide. This, of course, of importance. And Valery Brisic and his colleagues will gladly have a look into that, how it will go. The question is, we always lack this layer between uh, fundamental technologies and a fully functional plant, which we will be prepared to buy. So this is a fundamental issue, which is more acute in Russia compared to abroad. But we thank uh, this foundation and the Skolkova cluster, Skoltech Foundation, because it was their job they were called to actually resolve this. Thank you, Andre. We will come back to 
the theme of uh, economic incentives to develop uh, innovations in the oil and gas. But as we say, the, the bridge of the pilot operations it's crucial, and uh, we, we can see that when we talk to our startups and we talk to our colleagues in this a key industry like oil and gas. There's a key challenge is to convince the oil and gas people that technology is crucial, and this is one of the real challenges. But to continue about innovation processes within major corporations, and we, uh, if we were able to be more specific about this company, ReTech. The acronym contains the, the word innovation, like I, Retech. So what's the difference in your company when compared to the major Luke Oil company? And how do you evaluate the technologies that you receive? Well, dear colleagues, as some classical authors said and wrote, It's okay now. Dear colleagues, as some author said, if you want to resolve a problem, appoint a person responsible. So we may be the only reps in the, uh, between the major and deputy uh, and mid-size. We have a deputy director for innovations. And this job is not only to be responsible. This guy has his own budget, his own directorate under him comprised of both uh, young scientists and uh, more experienced scientists. Can you hear me? Naturally, in their production or operations activities, uh, they face certain daily uh, problems, issues. And uh, in the daily operations, we will uh, rechannel those problems to the scientific uh, department again, and they are talking to s to the uh, special institutions, universities, and research institutions, design bureaus, and they would be resolving that more uh, more promptly. And just as Andre said, it's quite important, despite that the fact that the scientists would come quite often, and in the very first moment, you look at the uh, proposal, and it seems to be silly sometimes. But we will still consider all of the proposals. We will take them through the process of uh, scientific councils, through all of our scientists, so that we don't throw the baby with the, with the dirty water. So uh, we believe the things we do and the way we do it has become possible because of the separate standalone budget uh, appointed people and the management's vision uh, and the local management vision that this has to be implemented. So on the one hand this was uh, decision making was delegated to a separate authority and closer to the actual project thinking. So on that level they have concentrated both the budgets and the competencies, the talents. Correct. As the innovations development in the implementation is the key uh, core business for ReTech. What are the other preconditions needed in the industry in order for the innovative development to be there, to, to be more dynamic? Some systematic preconditions for the whole of the industry, is that from the academic uh, university support or research institutions support, is that from that, that's probably should be more of the economic and financial incentives, as Andre has shown in his presentation despite the fact that there is a certain margin now at the Bajan of a uh, suit of uh, reservoirs and deposits, we understand that the global development of these processes and technologies uh, may only happen at this stage of further steps when the government will actually have a closer look and bring, bring them closer together. So the companies that do uh, business with the, uh, deposits hard to recover, hardly recoverable. So they organize it with some problems with noise. So just talk right into the mic. Um, we, we observed through much interest the, well, the business of EMC and also what you elaborated already, how you cooperate with, uh, with oil companies. 
Could you please share your experience what EMC is doing in terms of R&D and uh, how do you how do you run this innovation process? How do you cooperate with your industry partners? EMC is a technology company. And as a technology company, we clearly do not have oil and gas problems. So all of our research is done in co-innovation. Co-innovation with two important partners, with the oil and gas companies or oil fuel providers, as well as co-innovation with the universities to fulfill the gaps of um, the gap uh, of technologies that uh, or competences that we do not have. So in that way, I think we have um, innovated uh, in the way we do business. We uh, all of our research, all our research is divided into uh, into research programs that we conduct with the major oil fuel providers, and then the industry. Um, do we have the the control? I want to show you this slide. Um, we are in a very unique position in Brazil. Brazil is, um, we are at a technological park uh, in the center of Rio, where we, if you can pass that please, where we share uh, the grounds with the major oil and gas uh, uh, companies in the world that do exploration, including Petrobras, but also BG, uh, outside of the park, Shell, Stat Oil, uh, Sinopec, and others were coming to, to, to the exploration, and oil field providers. All of our research projects come in collaboration with them, in where they bring the technological challenges, uh, you, developing mature uh, fields, developing the ultra deep waters, the pre tall layers and also developing uh, um, new technologies for seismic processing, which is the ultimate frontier from a computational standpoint. Uh, our greatest uh, uh, innovation so far, uh, be it in seismic, be it in collaboration, allowing... Brazil is very similar to Russia in the sense that we have continental uh, dimensions. We need to be able to collaborate between different oil field and oil field exploration in very far regions of the country. We also need, as a global company, to enable collaboration between all of our customers in different geolocations, countries and continents. We're very open to that and that's, that's what we are doing at the center. So every project involves industry collaborators, be it partners or oil field providers, and industry and, and, and uh, university teams that work with EMC researchers and innovators. The way we structured our research is that we operate as independent R&D centers. There's one in Brazil with specialty in oil and gas, but there's one in, in Russia as well. We're probably opening one in Israel. And we function as basically startups with uh, uh, incentives. We have our own budget to develop innovation, to co-develop and to, with autonomy, to uh, collaborate with companies and providers and universities, which give us the necessary agility and, and, and speed to do it. Our fourth collaborator and very important in Brazil, as well as in the rest of the world, is, uh, is the government. It's very important to have a, um, a government structure that not only fosters innovation, but creates the necessary framework, be it in terms of incentives for those who are producing oil, be in terms of incentives for those who are doing innovation in country, supporting new IP models, supporting new um, uh, uh, business models in which for us to, to exchange. And that has been fundamental in guaranteeing our success. We inaugurated the center uh, uh, a couple of months ago. We've been in operating for operation for over uh, two years. We already have more than 10 patents in place. And we do, we're doing field trials with companies in Brazil, Petrobras mainly, but also companies that operate in Europe and in the Americas. And uh, well, since such industry cooperation is not so is not so common in Russia. 
Could you outline, so what are the key success factors to start such common cooperation, R&D cooperation projects? So if you speak about single projects, so what are the key prerequisites or key success factors? Uh, what we needed to do was to, to develop a language, a language in, you, in which to collaborate. So first of all, uh, uh, in order to be collaboration, you have to understand what you're going to do with IP. Oil and gas companies uh, consume IP to find hydrocarbons. This is their business model, this is what they want to do, so they consume, they use the IP internally. Technology companies, on the other hand, use the IP to develop new products, new features, and new services that they can sell out to the market. Developing a language where you create uh, frameworks, win-win frameworks, which are good for the university partners that, yes, need to, to keep their IP, and in Brazil, uh, Brazil being uh, uh, essentially an open source uh, country, uh, one of the difficulties for us going into was to make sure that we created the necessary IP uh, maintaining uh, competences in the university so that the universities had the IP, treasured the IP, and could use that for collaboration. So understanding and creating this framework is fundamental in trading uh, uh, um, collaboration in that sense. Uh, I, my experience is that uh, uh, reaching agreements between companies, uh, similar research companies, we have, uh, we have research projects with Siemens, with whom we share fences, uh, with BGs, it's easier in Brazil than with uh, universities. And I think that's the great contribution of the major companies, which is to bring the maturity to the market and to develop the whole ecosystems in which we bring the university up to that language and to this collaborative new environment in which innovation is possible. Also bring in the startups and develop the, the, the whole wave, you know, um, uh, uh, there's a saying that says, you know, the high tide will bring all the boats up, and we're true believers of that. We believe that in, in Brazil, uh, as well as the rest of the world, that's the fundamental role that we need to play. Thank you, thank you Karen. Yes, that's right. The topic itself and the techn technology challenges there are very common for a number of uh, Russian companies. Uh, talking about joint R&D projects with enrollment of universities, uh, it, it has a great potential, of course, in Russia as well. So continuing this, continuing the topic of um, services in the oil and gas industry. I would like to ask Natalia from SAP. Uh, one of the areas uh, that is SAP is tackling now in Russia is automation, complex automation uh, of applications in oil and gas uh, and what we call intellectual uh, deposits and reserves. So the question is, aside from the technical issues, uh, what is the actual innovation thing about this process and developing this project and the, uh, the, the product for an intellectual uh, field? And what are the factors, what are the prerequisites uh, needed to be set in this innovative ecosystem for the products to be developed faster and implemented faster in Russia? Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to have discussions in this very nice uh, company here uh, and tell you what we can bring uh, uh, something useful in development of oil and gas industry in Russia. About, we're talking about unique deposits, unique fields here. Uh, we, we have worked for over 14 years with all of the Russian majors, Russian major companies and foreign companies. The SAP company has a good understanding of new technologies and the uh, capability of uh, processing data uh, is, is always it always goes in line with economy and commercial commercial targets and objectives. So we understand uh, an, an asset's life cycle within oil and gas industry, and the target the the, the purposes are the same. On the one hand, to optimize the investments because they, are, they keep growing, the investments keep growing, and I'll tell you why later. And then on the other hand, to keep for a, as a longer time, as much as possible, uh, the deposit uh, uh, reserve to be effective for many more years by increasing the recovery rate, by increasing efficiency. So this paradigm, 
but it's classical it's been it's been there for years but in the present day conditions uh, it's undergoing some changes the times when they were discovering brand new deposits like Romashkin Square the assets are aging now they're different they're old now so in many cases we have brownfields now and I'm talking about operational efficiencies so the older techniques, just like on the sitting on uh, on the surface, they have been exhausted. The existing techniques have been exhausted. So we have a look. We have to have a closer look. How do we operate with the data that we get, we receive from the underground equipment? And my colleagues have talked about that today. There's lo lots of technologies available today, including the thermal pressure gauges, sensors, the thermal pressure pressure gauge, and what about greenfields like Vancor? And then you know, there's so many gauges there. Uh, in, in, in that field and we're talking about intellectual management intellectual management of the wells so this is not out of space anymore so the management objects have changed so these triggers have given birth to new technologies and for many years IT companies have worked on that and now maybe I will give you a definition of what's an intellectual field this is uh, firstly, an integrated model of a field uh, 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 and a well, but at the same time, it could not be just there in the open air, uh, s hanging there. It should be permanently serviced by all types of personnel available in a company, to both technical, technology, service. Uh, we have to do both surface and underground equipment in order to take temporary decisions. And these decisions are about what wells need to be produced currently, what the limitations are, and what we can do on a particular well with the resources currently available. So this is the well model multiplied by all the technology which has become available now. Please show my slide on the screen. That's why IT companies uh, play a big role presently. One example is BP and other companies uh, with uh, whom we work very closely. And um, you can see here data on the hydrodynamic uh, formation model and some other data. So first of all, we collect the data. When you come to a company, they say, OK, we have a lot of data, all the data necessary. But the next question is what to do with this data? Can we process it well? And here we have the big data paradigm. Yes, we do the hydrodynamic model, and all our institutes uh, do this model for the planning horizon from 1 to 20 years. But how often do we amend this model? Maybe just once per quarter thanks to the LIPS model. But we want to have um, more frequent amendments uh, to our model to have uh, better quality operational decisions. Um, and um, our in-memory database uh, can help us there. And it's not just uh, the ACP, which is the supplier, SAP. Furthermore, our colleagues uh, mentioned uh, a collaborative environment today. Iskander mentioned that we need to work with partners, and uh, another speaker said that no single research can be done by one company single-handedly. A collaborative environment is very important. Uh, we bring together all the data from the geologists, uh, from the drillers, uh, from the operational engineers. Uh, now, as BP did in Obedin, we can create common centers uh, where we can control our assets remotely, which uh, saves our time and effort. Instead of uh, sending an expert by helicopter, wait for the good weather to be established and uh, send an expert by helicopter, we can have this remote control. So we've collected the data and analyzed it. What next? Uh, If we mention the ODB cycle, a term which we have uh, from uh, 
the military and defense sector. After that, we need to have some very clear analytics. We need to carry out an analysis. We need to plan our actions we take in the field. Take our oil and gas companies in Look Oil and Sogut, and our top managers at those companies want to do and want to have an analysis, a real-time analysis of what's happening in these wells. So we, as an SAP company, believe, to answer your second question, that it's important to provide state-of-the-art technologies, but we also want to work locally. And our objective is cooperating with some local partners, for example, for certain projects, who have great experience in formation modeling, in uh, calculation of uh, energy efficient equipment and uh, buying and procurement of this uh, highly energy efficient uh, equipment. Uh, we work with partners who have a big databases and we seek to create local interfaces and uh, provide data control panels as seen by our top management in the oil and gas industry, plus uh, personnel training. Gray age uh, is uh, not a problem that has been just uh, invented. This is a real problem. So we need to have uh, expert systems uh, who will help uh, our personnel to work uh, in the workshops, uh, in the fields, uh, and we also provide uh, technologies uh, with this goal in mind. Uh, thank you. Indeed, when we talk about personnel, it's an important block of the innovation problem. And I think we will go back uh, to this uh, work uh, in the external environment, because if we talk about a smart field, uh, this is uh, a more complex interdisciplinary cooperation. You've mentioned uh, the topic of effectiveness, uh, which is important for oil and gas companies. And now I would like to give the floor to Anton. The topic of effectiveness. Uh, you started working in Schlumberger, and I guess that now you work on the same topic in McKinsey. Effectiveness and innovation. What are the factors of success uh, for oil companies? <clears throat> what is needed to increase effectiveness uh, and what is uh, the most interesting experience in Russia or abroad from your point of view. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, I would like to try to look at this problem as a manager of uh, an oil and gas company because we share all these uh, issues uh, of um, effective uh, technology management with uh, our clients. The problem of cooperation that we can see is that, of course, technology is important. Every, everyone agrees with that. But not everyone agrees uh, on to what extent a company should be a technological leader, should we be a pioneer in uh, technology development, or oh, can we just be the followers? Maybe we need to let someone else uh, try a new technology, and if it's successful, then we will also use it. There is no single answer as to which technology is correct. And um, that's why there are a lot of risks uh, in the oil and gas industry. This is why new technologies arrive in this sector much later than in other industries. Uh, for example, the average technological cycle of the oil industry is about 30 years. Uh, that's the cycle of uh, development of a technology from the idea to deep uh, commercialization. But if we look at consumer goods, uh, it's less than 10 years. If we look at medicine, it's 15 years. But in the oil and gas industry, uh, this technological cycle is 30 years. This is because uh, oil and gas companies are risk averse. Uh, they are reluctant to take risks. They take on a wait and see approach. Another issue 
is uh, whether a technology is indeed effective. Natalia showed us a good picture. Everyone agrees that beta is needed, that everyone is um, lacking beta, but we've analyzed um, to what extent this data is used by companies. Uh, and actually, more than 90% of data is not playing any role in the decision-making process. Uh, there is a beautiful and pretty picture um, of uh, the availability of a lot of data, but this data is just not used. Another factor is that of uh, the collaboration of uh, an oil company and um, a technology developer, a small service company, for example. So in terms of collaboration, there is a certain clash of interests there because uh, a technology that can be born within the oil company is uh, something in which the oil company sees risks. And uh, sometimes the oil company is afraid of uh, competition, of losing its edge. But of course, if uh, a service company has uh, some technology and develops some technology, it's reluctant to share it with an oil and gas company because uh, they do not want to lose their business. And then they understand that their opportunities of uh, getting some uh, profit from this technology is going to become less. Uh, so that's the problem which prevents uh, technologies uh, from effective penetration and adoption. Three factors uh, which are quite evident as to why technologies do not work very well. First, uh, technological development should not be separate uh, from the idea of business development of a company. It's difficult for scientists to talk with a businessman because scientists always have lots of interesting ideas, but they don't understand the business goals of a company. They don't understand uh, the priorities of companies. So here, it's important to bridge this gap between scientists and companies uh, so that Everyone understands uh, what goals uh, this technology will help to achieve uh, in the long-term perspective. And for example, in terms of understanding what uh, production will be and how this technology will help grow production. Intuitively, it's uh, very clear. Everyone understands this. but. Uh, I'm not quite sure that scientists uh, can always find a common language with uh, business companies. Uh, secondly, the question of management. Of course, investors are always interested uh, in money, but I believe that uh, portfolio technologies should always be run as uh, portfolio investment. And we always have to choose some technologies that we want to develop in which we need to invest. Uh, and then we need to decide whether we want uh, to develop certain technologies single-handedly or in partnerships. What we want to do by ourselves, uh, because it's our competitive edge, and we don't want to give this advantage away. And the last factor is uh, the process. Uh, this was mentioned by our colleagues. Uh, is there any throughput uh, process of uh, technology management? And once again, the stage gate process or the standard technology management process uh, shows how efficient technologies are and uh, whether people are involved uh, in technology development at each stage. Uh, and of course, we have uh, successful implementation of technologies uh, when people who are responsible for the implementation of a technology are involved in all the discussions even at the early stage uh, and take part in the decision-making process. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anton. The last point you mentioned, the 
interaction between businessmen and scientists and the involvement of business people at an early stage of uh, technology development. Uh, judging from your experience uh, with uh, Fabergé, what efforts need to be taken to make sure that technology developers uh, and uh, businesses uh, collaborate with each other? That's what I saw in Flamberger, in uh, other companies, uh, when some development priorities are discussed uh, in the technological block. Very frequently, there are also representatives uh, from the businesses. Uh, in Schlumberger, for example, there are business segments. And um, there, when we talk about some technologies involving a frank job, we have uh, some uh, service companies, we have uh, people who are involved in the process of technology development. Uh, we have sponsors involved in this process. Uh, and the same applies uh, to oil companies uh, who have a certain objective, uh, a certain target. They know what they want uh, to do. And uh, there should be a person from these companies who will be involved in this process. Uh, and if there are some assessments to be made, uh, uh, if it's decided whether this technology is going to be useful or not, uh, we need to involve a person from the oil company to take part in this process. And then this will provide results. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is about quite simple principles of uh, business decisions. The next question goes to Victor from Gazprom of Gas. Victor, I would like to listen to the opinion of Gas, which is part of uh, the Gazprom group, uh, and it's also a leading gas institute. What sh uh, should be the ideal collaboration between uh, uh, institutes and universities and oil and gas companies? Uh, what are the priorities of such cooperation? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am an expert uh, on forecasting, geological survey, and uh, development uh, of uh, oil and uh, gas deposits. Uh, a little bit on what uh, I have prepared. <clears throat> I'll give you some concrete figures. In 2013, Gazprom spent 62 billion rubles uh, on geological survey and exploration of oil and gas resources, uh, and much more on production itself. And the optimization of uh, this, these costs is a very important scientific task, uh, and a very important task of uh, innovative research. Here we have the oil and gas uh, provinces uh, in Russia, including our well-known Uringoy, that red dot, which is the center of gas accumulation in the northern hemisphere, so to say. Gazprom works uh, both uh, onshore and offshore. Of course, offshore is uh, our near future, but we still have several uh, targets uh, onshore to reach. To, to achieve. Uh, if we speak ab about the current period uh, of uh, oil and gas production in Russia, in which all companies are involved, both uh, government and private companies, uh, you can see the range of those tasks and the range of challenges. Uh, the first one is the fact that right now the conditions have become much more complicated, and we are only starting out with the Arctic Shelf. We believe that innovations uh, in geological survey and exploration involve new forecasting methods, uh, new scientific concepts and paradigms, which help us optimize uh, the deadlines uh, and the results uh, of uh, surveys uh, and exploration, because, um, of course, um, we need to build a, a bridge between exploration and the actual production. Optimization of um, drilling technologies. Uh, here, innovations uh, have a huge role to play. 
I'm talking about new technologies and new equipment uh, in geology, in uh, production, actually uh, all the areas uh, which uh, help us uh, to better explore and develop uh, hydrocarbon fields. We have several areas of um, scientific optimization of uh, a mineral base uh, development in Gazprom. Here, it's not only about the Gazprom group, because several companies work on this territory. And uh, a big part of this territory has not been licensed out yet. And a major part of this work, as we believe, uh, is the search and establishment uh, of uh, single geological models uh, of uh, oil and gas fields, uh, uh, in particular by uh, using all the data that we have, uh, including the space data, the geological methods, the re-evaluation and free assessment of potential resources, and finally, development of uh, oil and gas reserves uh, and uh, the best management uh, decisions in all the area. I did on purpose uh, not so many slides here. So practical uh, viewpoint. I have here some notes. A problem which is urgently requiring innovations. The final development of the remaining gas at the gigantic deposits which are almost fully exhausted. But the geological deposits actually sitting there down underneath is up to 15 percent. So increasing the capacity of e extracting the remaining gas from Uringoy, Medvezhye and others, old bigger major deposits. And then the second issue that we started our discussion with the non-traditional resources for oil and gas, unconventional. And I did not accent your attention, did not bring your attention that Russian land has huge conventional deposits of gas to a lesser amount of oil. I'm talking about conventional. But when we count uh, unconventional resources, first resources, potential, and then uh, producible, there's so much more than conventional. And that goes both for bazen of oil and the production of gas from uh, low uh, dense, low permeability layers. Let's say under Urengoy, the resources of gas uh, are more in Urengoy, uh, non-conventional rather than conventional. So this is a, a revolutionary problem, how to produce those goals in low permeability uh, reservoirs. That goes for oil as well, but we're closer to gas, you know. This is it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Shall we come back to uh, the Arctic area and offshore Arctic? This is uh, a topic for uh, years and years ahead, for, for the whole of 21st century, and it has to do with all of the oil and gas companies involved. And this comes, as I said at the beginning, this is an interdisciplinary theme, a topic. So what is your evaluation of the prospects of joint research joint R&D projects and uh, what has already been done or is being done as joint projects. We, for example, heard some projects uh, from Brazil of joint R&D. So is anything happening right now in the Arctic or are there any plans for any joint research there? Yes, there are plans for joint projects with some research institutions. And first of all, it's mostly for exploration. Exploration. There's a lot of uh, bigger institutions since the 80s. A lot of research institutions, and we are always in, in, in contact with those. We have some joint uh, jobs done together. Most of the cases, Gazprom finance is financing this uh, research. And we're constantly exchanging information, data, and ideas. Thank you. But so far, there was, has been no companies between the oil majors, or uh, sorry, gas majors. So so far, this is just uh, just a target. Uh, this is uh, good. Uh, this is just wishing, good wishing. For, but this is uh, for the nearest future. Thank you, Victor. Uh, next question. We should be coming back, and we mentioned that several times. The role of the state, the government, 
in economic incentives to develop innovations. So the floor goes to Denis Borisov. And I'm asking a question. What is the experience, uh, what, what research has been done looking uh, at the Western experiences? What is the process of uh, incentives uh, for, for innovations in oil and gas? And how do you relate that to what is being done in Russia or existing incentives in Russia? Good day, colleagues. If you look at uh, everything that has to do with oil and gas production and the complex uh, deposits or reservoirs in the US, they call it calm revolution. So it's not only a matter of correlation between smaller producers and the high efficiency of the small and medium sized oil companies, which is a major component, but this revolution would not be made possible without the proper economic content to it. So the economics are like this. Again, looking at the US, the government has offered definite fiscal preferences to this group of producers which uh, could have uh, the drilling costs uh, take it immediately to the overall costs. And as we know, the main tax in the US is a profit tax. So the companies will, uh, were winning uh, their competitive struggle, competitive edge to the majors, and the majors couldn't relocate their drilling costs to the overall costs. And they had to do a lot of drilling. And that was a, an important component contributed to the uh, overall success. So we, what I've been witnessing for the last few years is a key, the key issue for the increased recovery for service. Everything has to do with economics. As it is today in Russia, the economics shows that uh, whatever benefits have been offered for the treaties and permeability and for, for some other reserves, they hardly cover half of the hardly recoverable deposits. And there is still no defined term in Russia what is a hardly recover a recoverable deposit. Let's say Achinska, is it one or not? So formally it is, but if you look into the tax code of the Russian Fed Federation, there is no description of the Achinsky deposit. Or if you uh, have high water cut well. Uh, so as a result, you will see what Andre has shown in his slide. Even the benefits that had, had been offered for Bazen deposit. And if a, a tax maneuver happens there, and that the size of benefits will increase at the Bazen of deposit, because the DPI will be kept at zero, unlike some other benefits that will be kept and increased for the differential of the current tax rate and the DPI. But the issue is still there. We should be looking for other solutions. There is a universal solution worldwide, financial result tax, or call it whatever the different terms for the tax, the final tax. But what it is today, uh, the mechanism of the export tax, they only keep it in Argentina and Kazakhstan, nowhere else in the world. Argentina and Kazakhstan, the export tax. The rest of the world is not inviting any more bicycles. They're just taxing the final financial result, uh, which gives you and uh, gives the company an additional incentive and allows for the company to plan their risks in a more in a proper way in a better way so in Russia if you look at the development of the tax system after 6066 uh, regulation the upstream has got some benefits like four dollars a barrel and Andre has shown us a good slide where you can see that including capex less uh, the current profitability for western siberian is nine dollars with capex it's about twenty dollars so those four dollars was an important com component but one year later the lion's share of that additional income was already up taken out because of the ndpi tax grew so that maneuver that tax maneuver that we expect and we're discussing now there would be a positive effect for the upstream but it all depends on the current oil price. One at, at the price of 110, it'll be plus three. At the price of 70 dollars, it'll be zero break even. So as a result, uh, the, the companies do not manage to build a fundamental system of uh, operation that would allow to involve uh, into into the development with a more sophisticated uh, increased recovery techniques. Retech is a good example. 
So, so many years ago, uh, the team policy lab invented those chemicals, and now they have thermal gas uh, influence to the uh, uh, reservoir, and then Gazprom Neft, together with Shell, they're trying to to make an uh, experiment on the polymer uh, water cut treatment at the Salim field. So th there's not so many projects like this because it, it all comes down to both down to uh, cost management because the investor would ask, oh, why should I invest? What is the recovery rate? Uh, uh, what is the return on investment? So in this case, we would need a roadmap that would allow to build an operation system, a plan, because we we need to go there to the Arctic but uh, without increasing the recovery rate uh, any attempts to involve uh, the deposits that as are uh, not profitable now uh, they should not be building any better forecast for production in Russia especially considering when you build your forecast on production and then you have it an, e an even forecast a flat forecast then the uh, uh, range a whole range of uh, motley tax benefits does not allow for a proper long-term planning because maybe the production will not drop but what do you do with the production that has to be taxed additionally from the state's viewpoint the case may be that the increased production will not bring any benefits but actually will uh, decrease the budget uh, incomes so th there's quite a few challenges and it's been even more complicated uh, uh, with the uh, Russian and Western cooperation problems, like if you look at the Southeast Asia experience like Malaysia, where they do use uh, modern techniques, uh, nitrogen pumping and CO2 uh, injection, that is mostly done with uh, Western managers like Exxon people, or you, if you look at the, at the Chinese, you look at the CNPC, they're quite partly using the increased recovery techniques quite modern but China is very specific in its own class okay time is time is running but you can also look, look at the other Western experiences so that you can borrow the best practices and that will allow for the Russian uh, oil production increase and the KIM uh, will increase from what what is it currently 35 there's a lot of things to be done it all depends on the federal executive authorities. And this is the opinion of the government of the country. Thank you, Dennis. The federal authorities, it's, it's very interesting. And a question to Alexei here. From the viewpoint of the Ministry of Energy, what are the priority mechanisms or techniques to introduce incentives to introduce new technologies. So what is being done and what are the targets, the challenges, and that's sti still underway. Thank you, dear colleagues. We are having an interesting discussion here, wide range of issues to be covered. What is affecting the development of innovations here and how do we stimulate that? Dennis has told us in a lot of detail on what is happening here in taxation in uh, the fuel and energy field. and. Um, I agree to Dennis. Uh, aside from one thing, not everything depends on economics. Okay, this is very important, but it's not the only uh, factor. Again, uh, saving time, I will tell you, uh, in, in our country, a developer of breakthrough technologies is not always capable of finding a client, a customer. So this corridor of cooperation, of coordination between a developer and the end user. This corridor has to be built and arranged and simplified. So this is a question of e economics. It's also a question of pure administration, bureaucratic regulations. Not mostly from the government, but from the oil and gas companies themselves. So when we talk about economics, we should remember that the fuel and energy industries of Russia is contributing 50% of the Russian budget, 50% of the national budget. So when we talk about taxation maneuvers and economics, please remember that. So when we're developing the energy strategy for the year, up to the year 25, we have a target uh, of changing the role and contribution of fuel and energy uh, contributor into a different economy. So it should be not a locomotive of the economy and the budget, but it should be an infrastructure 
economy. So this is a key uh, factor for the future. So when we talk about taxation incentives, uh, we're now de developing a draft project uh, on the taxation of the fi final financial result. So this draft is sitting with the ministry, and the draft has been uh, circulated with the ministries, and we are now collecting uh, feedbacks, opinions. A lot was said on the measures that had been taken by the energy ministry for the taxation incentives for uh, hard to recover deposits. We also heard here the term of a roadmap. We need a roadmap. Yeah, I agree. We, we do need a roadmap. Well, maybe we need several roadmaps. Uh, we have already approved one roadmap, or government decree has approved that, on an, an approval of innovations in the fuel and energy. And that roadmap is trying to build this uh, corridor from the forecast of uh, scientific technology development, field that which is coordinated and being correlated with the national forecast for science and technology development. And that uh, would allow to specify, to point out uh, uh, the, the bottlenecks at the uh, oil, and, oil and field and energy otherwise. So that allowed us to pinpoint the breakthrough technologies and to see how do we bring those technologies up to the commercial utilization within the companies. And secondly, as it is now together with the Education Ministry and the Federal Agency for, uh, for Education, we are now developing a roadmap that would allow us to develop and design our f future. So we have a better understanding what are the current burning issues in the fuel and energy and what objectives should be put, what tasks we should be putting to our industrial research institutions. So, so that will be included in their fundamental research and we should have an understanding what should be the techniques and the mechanisms to implement those. One more thing. Eleven companies in the fuel and energy with government shares. They have a, a must program for innovative development, which is mandatory. At, at the plenary meeting, our Prime Minister has mentioned that. So there was an instruction that a certain percentage of the incomes of the companies should be mandatory channeled into this innovative development. With all due respect to our oil majors, oil and gas majors, but it's not always that they uh, make good programs, uh, or rather that it's not the burning issues that they're tackling, really. So it's a question of economics again. The financing size is 170 billion rubles a year, 170 billion rubles a year. So accordingly, if all of that money were channeled to the acute challenges that we have, then the effect would have been seen, but it's not happening. So as it is today, together with the Ministry for Economic Development and for the development institutions like Skolkovo, Rosnano, and others, we're developing a methodology, or rather we're amending the methodology recommendations to monitor and supervise this program execution. Excuse me, the program for innovative development. So this will be an important step to be implemented in the very near future. Uh, next, then the techniques for uh, techniques uh, for incentive uh, incentivization used abroad and that are not still introduced in Russia, but that could be successfully used here. One of those is called the mentorship technique when a company is coordinating with startups and uh, innovative SMEs and they you know escorting them is also so from the idea stage to the implementation stage to the actual commercialization stage this technique doesn't work here so far unfortunately uh, together with Skolko Foundation we are planning to have some events so I could actually tell you that November 19 we will held together with Skolkova Foundation. So I could actually tell you that November 19, we will held together with Skolkova Foundation on the platform of the analytical center under the Russian government. We'll have a roundtable for the development of the mentorship and venture finance in oil and gas. And one more. An order of the Minister of Energy. 
they've made a consultative council for the development of innovations in oil and gas industries. So this council is comprised of companies reps, science reps, technology platforms reps, so the, the, those platforms uh, and, and create, uh, things that are supposed to build closer relationship between science, production, end user, and finance to bring all those closer together. So this session of this council will uh, be there uh, as uh, within the second oil and gas forum, October 23, and that will be an open session. So issues will be discussed there on uh, what measures, what steps, uh, incentive steps could be taken from uh, the government side in order to uh, allow innovations in uh, fuel and gas. And in conclusion, I would like to thank uh, all of you here for very interesting presentations. And as a representative of the federal authority here, I promise that I will take all the notes with me. Thank you so much. And I hope that the results of this discussion will lead to very specific, practical steps to develop innovations in oil and gas industries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexei. And okay, we will all agree that economical incentives are hard to replace, and that is uh, that, that uh, would call for a separate discussion. But the job of coordinating all of the participants in the whole process, an oil and gas company, a research institution, a university, suppliers, developers, designers. This is a great, great job to, to do. And uh, we work with startups, and uh, we know where to go. We, we can see the problems uh, that we would like uh, the industrial developments, the pilot uh, stage going there. So we should be looking for ways to support participants. We know that companies are doing some neighboring uh, subjects and developments. So what we see is a, is a lack of this coordination. We should be building on this. So we started a little bit later. So we will take a few more minutes. Let's say some 10 more minutes. Now I would like to offer our distinguished audience uh, the possibility to ask questions from the room. And now our participants uh, will be able after that to answer those questions and then uh, we will have uh, a summary of what has been said before. Colleagues, uh, there is a mic in the room. And we have another representative from Skoltech. I have a question to the government authorities. Is there a strategy for recovery of the hydrocarbon base, uh, hydrocarbon resources uh, in the government? And what are the priorities uh, for this recovery? When oil recovery is more important uh, through the increasing of uh, the recovery rate of existing fields, uh, when is it more important uh, to recover all the resources uh, from the Baja and Sweet? Uh, and uh, uh, when do we need uh, to start developing the Arctic resources? So what are the priorities um, in terms of time or importance? As I said, the questions that you ask need to be considered uh, in the strategy for oil and gas production of Russia. That's the document which covers all these aspects. Furthermore, we have a general program for the development of the oil and gas industry. Right now, we are amending our strategy. We started this work um, early this year. But uh, you understand that we had a certain vision and understanding of where we were. We had certain challenges. Uh, but today, when this project is uh, almost ready, we started sending it uh, for approval to other agencies. But you know, there are huge changes uh, in the geopolitical situations right now. And it's uh, continuously changing almost uh, by the hour. And of course, it will um, influence our overall 
energy strategy. And I need to say that, of course, the Arctic uh, development uh, is uh, to be started by 2020. And as for the hard to recover reserves uh, or increasing the recovery rate of existing reserves, uh, we are currently discussing which is going to be the priority. That's one of uh, the many questions that we need to answer as we are working on this document. This is the Moscow State University Scientific Park. The Skolkova Technological Valley. You've mentioned uh, the presidential meeting where digital methods uh, were mentioned. And uh, what is the industry going to do? Is it going to introduce these digital methods? And, and are we going to use uh, Western technologies or Russian technologies here? Thank you. I think that's a question to our colleagues from Lukoil and Retech, if you don't mind. Um, so what are you focusing on in terms of digital communications? I'm grateful to our colleagues from SAP who have mentioned uh, the concept of developing uh, a deposit, uh, you can see that our building has a lot of satellite dishes on top of that. And uh, the concept of a smart field is something that we've been working on for a long time, almost since uh, the moment when our company was launched, was set up. and. We are constantly working with the best companies, offering their software to this effect. And most importantly, we keep accumulating our internal information and data on geomodeling. So that's something we keep doing all the time. The question of the choice of technologies. We want to have technologies that are currently available on the market, that we can purchase. And we can purchase uh, software together with the hardware. We need to have uh, some ready products which have proven their effectiveness. At the same time, and I'm answering your question directly, we are working on the development of our own software. And most importantly, our work is about knowledge about specific fields and reservoirs, about what we are going to do with them. And the question I asked at the beginning is about whether Russian developers have tested and proven products. If they have, we will gladly consider them without any delay. So the question is how to commercialize these good ideas how to turn these ideas into a working product and who will have the financial liability. If developers do not need money, then it's just a good idea. We invite everyone to work with us over a certain period of time. Anytime you want, we invite everyone to participate in development. I would like to add a few words. Of course, developers need money, strange as it might seem, according to our experience. But these problems are quite standard. How to move on from a good idea or from a prototype uh, to a technology that can be implemented by a company. And here, integrators, uh, service or IT companies uh, are to play a big role. They need to put it to introduce it into their range of services uh, 
and after that they can offer these services as something that has already been tested. Uh, and engineering and service companies uh, play a very important role here because they can integrate the ideas uh, developed by universities or startups uh, because uh, small companies uh, will find it difficult uh, to offer their technologies uh, to oil companies. Uh, well, it's easy for a small company to convince a big oil company. They say, we have a tested new technology, whatever it is, um, it will give um, additional recovery of oil in such and such reservoirs for such and such amount of money. If uh, this technology is ready, oil companies are always ready to consider it. But sometimes they just say, we have invented this and this, uh, but we don't know how much it costs, we don't know what this technology will do, and what the economic effect will be. And then the question is, who is to bear the financial liability uh, for this, for trying this technology? So the technology needs to be tried, needs to be tested, it's the key. And uh, the main criterion is uh, financial effectiveness. Of course, uh, if this is uh, a good product in terms of its uh, price and effect, no one needs to be convinced. Sometimes you just don't have any choice. But then another question arises. And this regards software products. Uh, how do we develop uh, this software product from an idea to a ready product which can be used by companies? Uh, so this is uh, the question of creating some uh, testing fields, testing ground for such software. And this is part of our roadmap that I have spoken about. Just a couple of words. Uh, We can also see it clearly as we work with oil and gas companies. Uh, and actually, two years ago, we announced that we are setting up a lab for testing new ideas. Uh, we have uh, a Russian industry council for oil and gas. And uh, these are IT experts, not businessmen. And we, we tell them, if you have a good idea, but you don't have uh, any uh, ground to test it, we are ready to offer you our lab to test this technology. And then the community says, if it's a good idea, then we are ready to co-invest it to commercialize this product. We will come back to you with a number of startups. Thank you very much. An important thing is to create a competitive environment in the service sector. Now this sector has been created and it's uh, quite easy to find a, a service provider, for example, a drilling company. It's not a problem. For example, our colleague here announces tenders, tells the companies the requirements, and uh, now there is a certain number of uh, companies uh, which are ready to offer services at competitive prices. Uh, so thank God this competitive market has been formed. Maybe it's still undercapitalized. There are some well-capitalized companies on this market. I think there are two of them, and all the others, uh, much smaller companies. Uh, and the big companies um, have much more opportunities for innovative activities. Uh, and they do this. But we want to have more companies. We want to have larger companies. Uh, and the question is, uh, once again, who is to bear the financial liability for certain activities? Uh, it's not just a question of uh, who earns the money. This is a more fundamental question 
in terms of uh, greater labor productivity. If you just start some projects that no one needs, as it turns out, then you just wasted your resources. Thank you, Andre. The last question from the room, and then each participant of the round table will give a summary of the potential. We are at the Open Innovations Forum, so let's take the innovative approach. What's the opportunity for innovations? Any other questions from the room? If not, then I suggest that we, we move on to the next part of our agenda, open innovations. What do you expect from them in the oil and gas sector? Well, that's a very broad question. What are we all expecting from innovations? Uh, I am uh, a more concrete person, a more down-to-earth person, and um, I can tell you that I quite agree with our colleagues from Lukoil. Andre, you are absolutely right. Of course, uh, we need to create uh, the final product uh, which will be of use to a company. It can be created through several methods. Uh, one method which you mentioned. It's good to have a box. You just uh, push the button, you check it, it works, you pay the money and you use this technology. And that's the first method. The second method is when developers offer an idea, and this idea can just become part of your innovative program, the innovative program of your company. That's the risks that your company is ready to take. It understands that it is ready to invest in this idea. And then the developers from the Academy of Sciences or from the university keep working on this idea, keep improving it together with the experts from your company, and it works. That's the second method. And the third method is when the developers have invented something, and as uh, Natalia rightly said, there are some kind people who say, well, we'll help you to develop your idea. But then, sorry, we are going to sell your idea. So they act as an intermediary agent here. And all the three methods have the right to exist. If we use those methods correctly, then we will have the proper innovative environment in our country. But of course, the university developers need to understand their role in this process. The oil companies must understand what they want to get from it. And those kind people also have to understand that the developers uh, want to have a share in this pie. And uh, that's my small contribution that I would like to make in this round table. Thank you, Iskander. Victor, your final speech regarding today's uh, topic. Thank you. I tried to say that there is uh, no big problem with developing and with producing the conventional gas. It's not a big problem. And Gazprom has uh, a huge number of uh, hard to recover resources, uh, which are very dense. Uh, and there are great reserves, but uh, the production is minimum. In Orengoy, there's a lot of oil, but we hardly can hardly recover it. Uh, these are some very difficult reservoirs uh, with low permeability, with great density. And Uritek had the same problem. There are huge reserves, uh, but the oil recover rate and gas recover rate is minimum. So in terms of open innovations in the gas and oil industry, I think uh, further cooperation will be mutually beneficial. Thank you, Victor. Denis, to conclude, I would like to say that oil companies uh, work for their own benefit. And if there are really worthy innovations that will help them, that will bring additional value 
it's good. Uh, of course, uh, we want to have a competitive market with uh, the market mechanisms uh, with minimum interference to the state. We don't really want just to have commands from the government from top to bottom. And going back to innovations uh, and greater costs. Uh, if we look at the forecasts uh, for the volumes of hard to recover reserves, uh, everyone agrees that it's about uh, billions of tons, uh, and uh, there are more of them than conventional reserves. Uh, but uh, if we look at production, then conventional reserves uh, have a bigger share. So hardly anyone agrees uh, that uh, a real breakthrough is possible here. And for small companies, uh, which cannot find enough financing to undertake those risks, it is important to involve banks and the banking community to finance this research. It's also a big element of this work. Thank you. Anton, I will probably say that such a round table is uh, very useful because we need uh, not just to listen to each other, but also to hear each other. We have uh, the business community sharing their concerns. We have the academic community listening to them and being listened. We understand that we cannot find a cure all very quickly because right now we have uh, a lot of focus on fundamental research and not uh, applicable research. We are strong in fundamental sciences, but not applicable sciences. So maybe we all need to think about how to help each other, how to find the right focus. Uh, and maybe R&D managers can help uh, the scientific community here to get as much benefit as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Indeed, it's a very useful round table, a very good exchange of opinions and information. I'm a very practical person because I represent a private company. And it would be very good to show you a specific product and say, well, look, uh, this is a product that we did together with a Russian company. So this way from the idea to the final product should be very short. And here we need collaboration. We indeed uh, found a strategic Russian partner, which has been working for a lot of time in the oil and gas uh, sector. And we found a solution for an integrated uh, planned uh, field with uh, different horizons. Uh, I think this is a unique solution. But uh, we need to ask the businesses, the companies, uh, do you really need it? Uh, is this product, is this solution really required? Uh, so I think we need to have interaction. We need to have a product which will be of use uh, for Russian companies. Thank you. I will be very brief. I want to tell you that since we really have some uh, issues mentioned by Anton, that is uh, moving from fundamental research uh, to real applications uh, to the real product, um, I wanted to show you that uh, thanks to Retech, the Retech company, that's the issue we are handling. They do not just uh, the applied research. Of course, it's 95% because we are the oil company. We are responsible. We are responsible to our shareholders. So we pay taxes and we pay about 40 billion dollars per year to the budget of the Russian Federation. If we make any big mistakes, uh, that will be of consequence uh, to the government budget too. So we don't have the right to risk greatly. We cannot just start using technologies that have not been tested. Uh, but 
once again, that's why we created the Russian innovative fuel energy company. As far as I know, that was the first example when the shareholders of a private oil company were ready to risk their own money. and try to test some fundamental research and use it in a real technology which can provide the benefits, which can create additional value. I agree with you. We risked this money because we understood that innovations is the future. We can see that the resource base is uh, deteriorating every year, and of course, uh, we will have progress. That's the only way out. Uh, the issue is uh, the speed of this progress. If we encourage it, it, it will be much quicker. But we will have progress anyway. So that's uh, the positive note on which I would like to finish my speech. Uh, thank you very much. Two aspects to add. My first idea will be rather original. In the life of any official, there are some protocol events uh, and bureaucratic forums where you just uh, say some introductory speech, you welcome the participants, um, you wish them all the best, but do not say anything of importance. Uh, but uh, my original idea is that this forum is not part of uh, those uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, events. Uh, I got great uh, pleasure from this exchange of opinions uh, which we had here. Indeed, uh, the problems that have been voiced here are very, very important today. That's the first idea that I wanted to mention. And the second one, to save the time, I'll just say that uh, I'm now convinced that the measures uh, and the actions uh, taken by the Ministry of Energy of Russia as a, a regulator in this industry are not separate from uh, the practical steps. Uh, we do not have, a, have any gaps uh, from the real life, uh, from uh, the real problems. Uh, what we do today, our priorities today, as officials are really aimed at uh, getting a real result. Thank you. Um, well, uh, we are living a, a, a unique um, moment in the industry where we are confined between uh, the difficulties of, of dealing with brownfields that are being exhausted and the technological challenge to, to um, explore the new ones. Um, what uh, it's fundamental right now is that we put the necessary methodologies, the necessary uh, process around that, that will allow us to, on one side, reduce the, the operational costs that make it economically viable to, to recuperate uh, brownfields, for instance. And on the other hand, uh, liberate enough resources for us to invest on the technologies that are needed for the new challenges. In Brazil, they are the ultra deep water exploration. Here, clearly, the Arctic exploration, which poses in incredibly uh, big challenges in, in terms of innovation. Uh, what is fundamental, and I understand that the nature of the companies are uh, very uh, old fashioned and, and very risk averse, but we have no choice. Uh, similarly to what's doing, necessity is moving us towards a, a, a new model, a new necessity to operate in a different way, such as, as we're doing with Petrobras in Brazil. We need the companies, and of course data is fundamental in this process, it's central to that, and in that sense I congratulate Nikolai for inviting you know, uh, two ICT companies uh, to sit at this table, a place where we wouldn't have uh, room in, in five years uh, before. Uh, and uh, to find ways in which to really cooperate between the oil and gas companies and oil field providers together with uh, uh, ICT companies, together with universities in which to tackle those, those, those uh, uh, innovations. And clearly the government has a very important uh, 
uh, fundamental uh, uh, role in this in which to support the necessary uh, funding for this to happen. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I think that indeed uh, we touched upon some very important aspects. Uh, of course, it's difficult to cover everything within just an hour and a half, but uh, we discussed the most vital issues of what needs to be done in the oil and gas uh, innovations. Uh, we have oil and gas companies. Uh, we have institutes and universities. Uh, we have technology and service providers uh, and also m small innovative companies working in the new areas. I hope that this round table has been of use not just in terms of uh, our communication, but we hope that the participants of this round table will be able to continue our uh, collaboration with our colleagues from Brazil, with uh, the IT companies. Uh, so thank you once again for very interesting speeches, for interesting uh, replies, and we will be happy to see you once again. Thank you.